my presentation is on culture shock. I also have a little side piece because since I'm in college, I was taking a photography course, a film photography course. So I have a couple of my pictures that I printed uh, from Nepal. So we'll see those later if they show up. If not, they're on the sideboard over there. Um, so as we just heard, the Maya Gold Foundation was started in 2015 to carry on Maya's wishes and goals of to stop human trafficking in Nepal. Um, we spent a lot of time with HCC, which is Himalayan Children's Charities in Nepal. Um, it's a uh, sorry. It's an orphanage where uh, abandoned or orphaned children are taken to uh, further their education in Nepal. And then they can help bring up their own communities and spread awareness about everything that's going on in Nepal with trafficking, with just bringing up education, with getting college degrees, and making that more available. Um, so, the, the saying that is on the Magdals Foundation website and is very followed is to help empower youth to access their inner wisdom and realize their dreams, which was super inspiring because I feel like a lot of people are told no and you can't do this, but with this foundation, they're like, you want to do this? You can't do it. Um, so this is all of us that went to Nepal, uh, the youth ambassadors and the team leaders. This is after uh, a talk, a Dharma talk at the Kopan Monastery in Nepal. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my film experience. Because with film photography, you can't take film through metal detectors and through x-ray machines because it will warp the film and you won't be able to see the images that you took. Um, for those of you who don't really know film, uh, it's on a roll, it's sight sensitive paper and you have to develop it and process it to see your pictures. So when you're taking these pictures, you don't know if you're getting pictures, if they're good pictures, and you have only 36 pictures per roll. Um, so I ended up taking nine rolls of film to Nepal and taking 324 pictures. And I did not know if any of them turned out. I didn't know if all of them turned out until I got back to school and processed them. Um, about each photo takes about an hour to print. So it was a very tedious work to get. I ended up printing 24 photos. So you'll see some of them tonight. So this is a photo that Matthew took. And then this is a film photo that I took. So you can see that it's like the same photo, but it's also very different. It gives you a different attitude and experience. This is a shopkeeper that I met in Nepal. And for those of you who don't know, a lot of people in Nepal speak English. And it's kind of a little bit strange because when you first hear Nepal and you hear poverty, you don't really think that these people are bilingual or multilingual. So it's a little like, oh yeah, we can communicate with each other and we can share experiences and culture very easily. I don't know if anybody can see these. Um, so these are two little street vendors that were just walking down the street selling fruit, more like New York City where you can buy like nuts for nuts or something like that. Um, and I just thought like, why don't I take these pictures? And I didn't know what I was going to get. Um, also, this one on the right is three people on a motorcycle. So people don't just ride one or two people on a motorcycle. They ride three, four, maybe a goat. Like, you really don't know what you're going to get. And then also the water is very polluted in Nepal. So everything is bottled. So this child on the left is getting a cap full of water from their parent. 
Um, these are all children. The two on the left are at the Ganesh School that we volunteered at for a couple of days. And on the right was just at one of the stupas, which is a temple or monument that we visited. And some more photos. Sorry, I like my photos. <laughs> Um, this was during their New Year's Eve festival, so we were there during their New Year's Eve, and it was a lot of festival and rituals, so on the left, they were building this 20 foot, foot height, I'm sorry, 20, story. Story, not story, but 20 foot high, uh, chariot that they would play tug of war with okay. um, and whoever took it to the center of the next town would have good fortune and good luck for the next year. Buddha, Buddhism and Hinduism. It's like more of a mix because they're very blended there. Um, so that's at the Copan Monastery on the left and I think they're actually both the Copan Monastery. Um, so when you go in shoes and when you go in places, you always want to take off your shoes because it's so dirty and dusty. You don't want to track all of that into your house or into a temple or wherever you enter. So whenever you go in somewhere, you usually take off your shoes as a sign of respect. So we're going to get into food because we all love food. So we were at the Roca house. So they always serve us back breakfast every morning. So this was a normal breakfast. Um, they're like potato cheese, like sausage-like things, but have no meat. And then pancakes and croissants and eggs and just like normal, normal breakfast food. And then on the left is delbat. So that's a very traditional meal that they have there. It is steamed rice, cooked lentil, vegetables, and chicken. And then they have, if you see the little tiny red dish, it's called pickle. It is not pickles. <laughs> it is a very spicy sauce, which, we, which I learned the hard way. <laughs> I don't like spicy food, so it was a bit of a shock to be like, yeah, I'll have some pickle, like relish, like thing. Yeah, okay. And then I took a big spoonful of it. And it was not pickle. It was very spicy, uh, like a dip, like a sauce. And then sometimes you'll get vegetables. A lot of the times we did not eat the vegetables or fruit that we were given because we weren't allowed, like if it was washed, the water could have been contaminated and we didn't want to get any diseases or anything like that. So we normally just left that aside. But if it was peeled, we could eat it. So a lot of carrots. And sometimes fruit, like peeled apples and things. So these are the most delicious things. They're like dumplings. <laughs> They're called momos. So these are like the very professional made momos. And those are the momos we made. <laughs> so that was made with the Sasane organization. So Sasane was started for, uh, for, sur for survivors by survivors. So their mission was to end physical and sexual exploitation of girls in Nepal. Um, so trafficking is a big thing in Nepal because of all the poverty and the lack of education. So they provided training for 328 women for paralegal and 270 of them are certified. And they've helped in 415 legal cases and rescued 238 girls in the last year. Yeah. So by taking this class on how to make momos, we supported their organization. And we also bought little trinkets that they had made at the end, like bracelets and a cookbook. And we also made a donation as an organization to their organization. Next thing is yak yogurt. <laughs> so. <laughs> They don't drink cow's milk there because cows are sacred. And they look, when we were like, oh yeah, it's just, it's yogurt. They looked at us, they're like, cow's yogurt? Like, 
that's really weird, because like, why would you drink that? It's a sacred animal. So cows are never really killed there, and sometimes when they're done being as useful as they are, they're just let loose into the street, and since nobody can kill them, sometimes they're just wandering the street eating trash, and it's kind of like, whoa, what's going on? Like, why are these cows just in the middle of the street? Like, you wouldn't really see that in New Paltz. But here they are, just like eating trash in the middle of the street. But then nobody wants to take them, but they can't be killed at the same time. So instead, they drink yak yogurt. It's really good. It's kind of sweeter than normal yogurt. Um, they're served in these little clay pots that they make instead of just the disposable plasticware which we would normally use, um, which was really cool. And then they would just take them and throw them in a bucket like it was no big deal. And a lot of us were just like, no, we're gonna take them home. <laughs> so a lot of us brought back clay pots that were made for yak yogurt. Um, the next thing is the animals. You're not allowed to touch, well, we were not allowed to touch the animals. <laughs> you can touch them, but it's not a great idea. Dogs really often carry a ringworm and impetigo and other diseases that are very easily contracted by touching them. So this dog happened to jump in our car after one of the hikes. So one of the Nepali kids grabbed it and chucked it out of the car. Um, also, there are a lot of monkeys, especially at a temple that we visited called Monkey Temple. They, you're not supposed to have any candy wrappers or candy in your hand or food. Everything has to be tucked away and put away. Um, and you're supposed to stay six feet, six meters away from the monkeys because they can jump on you and pull candy wrappers out of your bag, which happened to one of our <laughs> photo photographers. <laughs> but it was okay. <laughs> um, so, the pollution there. So when we first got there, it had been raining very recently, so dust wasn't a huge deal when we first arrived. Um, some people did choose to wear the masks the whole time, which was a smart idea. I did not. Um, it was a mistake, but we live and we learn. So a lot of times when it's not raining, the dust comes up and you breathe it and you start getting a cough or something. And just when the roads, because there's a lot of motorcycles, all the dust gets swept up, because, but because of the rain, it was mainly tampered down, which was very nice. And even the locals wear masks to protect themselves um, just because of the constant exposure of dust and germs. Also, Nepal doesn't have a sewer system because the population grew so quickly. They used to have septic tanks, but then the population grew, grew so rapidly that the septic tanks could not handle the amount of waste that the people were creating. So then they decided to just dump it into the river. Um, so sometimes when it rains, which it did, um, one of the sewer tops was left open and because of all the rain, the sewer water came up and flooded the stupa, which is their sacred temple, and we were walking through sewage water for a couple days on and off, which was lovely. <laughs> Um, there's also a lot of sound pollution during the day because of all the cars and the motorcycles and just the people and the street vendors and everybody's out and about doing their thing. So there's also a lot of sound pollution. No, I'm just gonna... This is a little video of the street, just a normal street in Nepal. This is a pretty tame street. Um, it is paved, which is not always common. Okay, well, maybe not. I thought I gave you permission, Matthew. I did not know that was a video. Okay. Um. Well, we can show that later, maybe. Okay. Um, so that's just a video of a normal Nepali street. The bikes are very close to the cars. A lot of times you can just reach out and touch another car. This is a normal day in Nepal. This is a vehicle. It looks like a tiller. <laughs> it has boiling water coming out of the top, or oil, I'm not sure. 
Um, and then the other one is a motorcyclist with a kid on the back. That's a very tame motorcyclist. So only the person in the front needs to wear a helmet. If there's a child in front of the adult driving the motorcycle, they do not need to wear a helmet. If there's a mother or a child, father, child, mother, only the father needs to wear a helmet, which can be quite intimidating when you're like, everybody needs to wear a helmet when riding a bicycle, and then you go to Nepal and you're like, just kidding, there's a goat on the back of this bike with three toddlers. <laughs> So next, I'm going to talk about shopping. So with shopping, you have to do a lot of bartering. It's a very common practice there, and it's not here, which can be a little intimidating when you first start out. So a lot of times, because they know that, at least with the Goal Foundation, we're mostly white, and we're mostly not looking like the Nepalese people. So they jack up the price because they know we're tourists. So normally what happens is what they actually want is about half the price of what they're asking, but since they bring it up so high, they know that the tourists are more likely to pay more than half the price. So you normally have to barter for everything, food, clothes, souvenirs, everything. And then on the left is, they have this whole street dedicated to these Necklaces, they're bought by the husband for the wife uh, for their wedding day. And then they're worn only on special occasions after that. Next, I'm going to talk about the money because I find that's the biggest change for me, at least, when going to a different place is figuring out how to pay for things. Um, so these are Nepalese rupees. So 100 Nepalese rupees is equal to $1. So a lot of things that we were buying were less than $10, which is 1,000 rupees. So it's kind of strange when you go and you're bartering and you're like, they say like 500 and you're like $500 and it takes a second and you have to step back and be like, no, that's $5. And then you also want to realize when you're bartering with these people, like, do they, like, is the 50 cents that I'm paying more really worth it to me? Or should I just give it to them and be like, yes, here you go, support your family? So that's a big thing to think about. Like, is it really worth saving that little bit of money or is it worth donating it? Well, not donating it, but paying for the item that you're going to get. Um, sometimes we got the coins and they're really not worth anything. They're more like just a souvenir. Anything below $5, you normally give out to beggars or just like people on the street that are like asking for it. Um, that's like common practice. A lot of the monks in the mornings will go out and do this first thing in the morning as their good deed for the day. Um, so the climate. So, when we first went there, we're like, yeah, we live on a mountain. And then we were talking to the HCC kids, and they're like, no, the, these are hills, like, by us. And we're like, those are giant mountains. <laughs> and they're like, no, those are hills. So it was kind of weird seeing it from a different perspective, because they're in the Himalayas. And just being like, okay, seeing it from their perspective, yes, we have a hill and they have mountains, but it's just different because we have no different size reference unless you go to the Catskills or something else, and those are still not as big as the Himalayas. So just seeing the difference between their hills and our hills, which was cool to like see that like play out especially when we were hiking. Um, next, we're gonna move on to the stupa. So this is the stupa. It, we lived about five minutes away from it. We would walk to it most mornings and get coffee. And you can only walk counterclockwise around the stupa. So every morning, everybody would be going in the same direction. So even though our 
coffee shop, which we were going to was like right around the corner. If we went the other way, we had to walk the entire stupa, another five minutes, only to get to the coffee shop that we were going to go to. Um, so this is a religious thing. So there's prayer wheels, which you should also only turn clockwise all around the bottom. And people will, like, they have these wooden, I guess you would call them pads that go over their hands and on their knees. And they will bow all the way to the ground and pray and then get up and walk a couple meters and then do it again. And they will do that the entire way around the stupa. Also, uh, you can go up onto the stupa. So there's different layers. So some days you were allowed only to the first or second layer, and some days were allowed all the way to the top. Usually the top is only for special occasions, and they only allow two or three people up there at a time. Um, that's what I saw when I was there early in the morning. Um, and then around the first layer, everybody is also praying. They have boards to make it more comfortable, but they're praying and they're there's monks all around, and as you walk, you get to see the different people that are there, like the shopkeepers opening and sweeping out their shops, and the monks that are sitting and praying and accepting donations to give out the next day, and then the people with disabilities that are also begging all the way around the stupa, which was a really big culture shock, because I feel like, especially in New Paul's, we don't have a lot of beggars. We don't have like a lot of extreme poverty where you're asking for five rupees or something like that. So to see that was eye-opening, to see that these people like are here every day trying to support their families. So this is all of us, just some pictures. Um, I felt that because we were traveling in such a large group, I didn't experience the culture shock as much because I always had somebody to relate to and to talk about it with. Although we were in such a large group, there was still all of the time that the Himalayan Children's Center, Children's Charity, were with us and integrated into our groups. So we still got the double perspective of what we knew and what they knew. But if we needed someone to connect to, we could turn to somebody from home and be like, hey, are you feeling this too? I feel kind of isolated. I don't really understand what's going on. And they could be like, yes, I'm feeling that too. Or like, hey, do you need some support? So I noticed that when I'm traveling alone, I experience it a lot more because there's nobody I can relate to. And you're just kind of on your own and you're just doing your thing and like if something happens to you, you can't be like, hey, did you see that? It's more like, that just happened and we're gonna continue on with our day. <laughs> Which was really kind of an interesting perspective. Um, this is all of us. I loved this trip, it was super amazing. Um, so one word that really stuck out to me through the whole trip, um, one saying that we went over before we went was be with rather than do for. Um, because when you're there and you're experiencing all these things, you want to help and you want to be there for them and you want to fix things. But there's really no way that you can fix all these immediate problems and you can like immediately help and change things. It takes time, it takes people, and it takes effort. So being with, instead of doing for, you get to experience what's happening and you get to bring that home and share it with other people and then have them also help you change that. Um, I also wanna say that the Maya Gold Foundation, we had several meetings before we went where we went over different things that we would experience there to help lessen the culture shock of the entire trip because if we were just thrown into Nepal, it would have been a complete change in your life. You wouldn't know what to expect. You might not have known the weather. You might not have known that they speak English. You might not have known 
how to survive there in a sense. So I just want to thank you guys for doing that and bringing our awareness about what's going to happen. Um, I have a video here, but I don't know if it'll play. If it doesn't, I think we're going to do questions. Yeah. Wait. Oh, we got This is a little side jump. Is it playing? No, it's not. It's playing up here. Do we know why? Mm -mm. Is it online? It's not embedded, right? <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties. taking street photography because it's, I do have some portraits, of course, of the shopkeeper and some of the girls that we were with, um, but I really like to capture like the unexpected, so a lot of my pictures are just interacting with each other, and I find that it's like a really special moment, and it's, it's there, and then it's not. So either you get the image, or you don't, and it's kind of stressful, especially with film, to be like, did I get it? I don't know. We'll see you in three months. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. So, what I heard, um, maybe with my ear filters on or something, was it like the pollution, the water, the begging, um, the, the conditions of traffic and motorcycle safety or not. And to me, a lot of it just trying to step outside of myself who's yeah. been there sounded, you know, if I were to judge it, like negative. Okay. Or darker side or something like that. What was your overall experience? Yeah. So did, did everybody hear that? Okay. So to me, Nepal felt very safe. Um, I wouldn't say, like, in the entire time that we were there, we never saw a car crash. We never, Michelle walked into a motorcycle, but that was, that was on her own. <laughs> um, we never saw a car crash. The cars were not very scratched. Nothing was broken. Like, yes, there were, like, power lines on the ground, but it was normal. <laughs> Like, it wasn't such a severe thing, because it's also our perspective that we've been so cultured to be like, there's dirt, we must clean it. Like, it's more of like a natural thing that happens. So to be there and to be immersed in it was very, like, we, I, I personally wasn't worried. I wasn't scared. Like... I was wondering, like, do accidents happen? And I asked one of the kids, and they're like, yeah, they do happen every time on the way to school. But in the entire time that we were there, I never saw a car crash. I never saw a kid fall off a motorcycle. 
I saw a goat dropped off the top of a van, but never a child. <laughs> so in the entire experience, it might sound unsafe and unwelcoming, but I never experienced an unwelcoming person. And everybody was so welcoming and being like, hey, come in, have tea with us, that it was just such a kind and considerate culture. Anybody else? Yes, all the way in the back. So a lot of times people learn it in school and especially with shopkeepers around the stupa. The stupa is a very touristy-like place. So just interaction with people every day, they have to kind of know English to get business. Um, so there are times where, especially at the Ganesh school, which is a school for the more impoverished, I think that's the correct word, um, they didn't really speak English, but sometimes they spoke a word or two, and you could still communicate using gestures and signals and just like human connection um, to communicate with them. So it wasn't impossible to communicate with somebody that didn't speak English. But a lot of times they do learn it through school or through just everyday exposure. And a lot of times people can't get very good jobs unless they do learn English. Anybody else? No? <laughs> 